My name is Michael Goldberg. Um, I'm our executive director for the Beale Institute for Entrepreneurship at Case and also a professor at Weatherhead. I'm in my office on a sunny day, sunny in Cleveland, which is nice. Um, and it's great to welcome um, Scott back to campus. Um, Bob Kirsch and I were talking beforehand. Sometimes, Scott, some of the folks that we have joined our speaker series are folks that are alums but have been kind of off in doing their thing and, and we're bringing them back to campus to kind of engage perhaps for the first time. And you've been um, such a presence on campus working with Bob, working with students and others. So um, I know some of the folks that are joining today already know you and have engaged with you and others are meeting you for the first time. But I wanna thank you for, for doing this today. As we, as I, I think I was just emailing somebody, election day two. So it's a good, you know, both the woods in the background and we can get off our Twitter and 538 updates for a moment. And I don't think anything's gonna change in the next hour in the elections. So. No, no. <laughs> Thank you for inviting me and I'm, I'm happy to be here. I wish I could be on campus. Um, you know, I had a wonderful conversation with Shruti last week or the week before. So that was, that was wonderful. And I'm just happy to uh, engage with as many people who have some modicum of interest in some potential pearl that I might offer. Awesome, great. Well, with that, and, and you mentioned Shruti, we're thrilled that um, Shruti, who's a PhD student in biomedical engineering, also a graduate, did her undergraduate here as well, is gonna be our moderator. Um, for those that are new to this format, we like you to participate. So let Shruti know in the chat if you have a question. Ideally, she'll ask you to unmute and ask it directly to Scott if you'd prefer to uh, have her read it, we could do that as well. And if you're on LinkedIn Live, just put a question in the chat and Doug and I will be monitoring. So with that, over to you, Shruti. Awesome. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for that introduction, Michael. Um, yeah, before we get started, I just want to reiterate, we would love it if whoever is able to can keep their videos on so we can kind of see each other and make this as interactive as we can, despite the fact that we have to do all of this online. Um, and yeah, we want this to be as interactive as possible. So we're hoping that everyone here is just going to drive the conversation. Um, so with that, I would love to introduce Dr. Scott Bruder. Um, he's our speaker today. Um, he has an MD PhD and he's now a physician scientist executive. He is the founder and CEO of Bruder Consulting and Venture Group, um, which is based in New Jersey. He has enjoyed a long and distinguished career in the discovery, development, and commercialization of products to diagnose and treat patients around the world. Um, like I said, he founded the Bruder Consulting and Venture Group um, in 2015 after spending 25 years in the industrial sector. Um, some of the things he did was he served in the C-suites of Stryker Corporation, he served as a chief medical and scientific officer at BD, and the chief science and technology officer. Um, and in addition to everything he's done in industry, he's also served on the FDA Advisory Committee for Cell Tissue and Gene Therapies and has maintained an active academic presence. He's now an adjunct professor at the Department of Biomedical Engineering here. He has been since 2011 after serving 13 years as faculty in the Department of Orthopedic Surgery. Um, so since forming his consulting group, his group has supported over $1 billion of licensed merger and acquisition activity and has led a wide variety of successful FDA submissions or approvals for new drugs, biologics, medical devices, and human tel cell and tissue products. Um, and right now, Scott is in northern New Jersey with his wife and dog, and he has two daughters, one of which is, I hope this is still current in the University of Michigan, and Juan is a student here at the School of Graduate Nursing. Uh, thank you for that, Shruti. Um, it's it's ninety eight percent accurate. The my my second daughter graduated from Michigan in April in my kitchen because she was sent home because everybody was sent home to the university. So my older daughter is uh, finishing her master's at Francis Payne Bolton, and my little one is now in Manhattan where she has begun law school, but she's doing it remote from a, an apartment that's $3,500 a month, which I'm trying to still understand. But uh, you know, all the kids are down there in the city and they're learning remotely, but I'm happy to be here. This is a new format for me. I, you know, I like to come to campus and try and find a way to coordinate with, with uh, 
with your chairman and uh, in, in, in engineering and meet with students and faculty as well as you know folks in, in orthopedics and biology. So I'm, I'm happy to be on campus. I have lots of friends and various places on campus and like to work with students and faculty. So I'm, I'm here to help however I can. Shruti's given me some guidelines for some of the kinds of questions. It's not a, typically what I do when, when I'm participating with some sort of academic center is I give a lecture on product development or career development or some specific product or even core technology from a scientific basis. And then we have some discussion and we go to lunch and we have coffee, but we're not doing a seminar today. Uh, I'm, I'm at your disposal and Michael called and, and reached out and said that this was something that they're trying to do through Weatherhead and entrepreneurship. Uh, again, I'm just, I'm happy to be here. Good, and we're so glad to have you. Um, so I could start us off with a question um, because I know a lot of us are students here. Um, a lot of us are in graduate school pursuing an MD or a PhD. You did both. Um, and traditional career routes that we look into are, especially going from academia, going from PhD, a lot of people suggest going into academia. Medicine, um, with an MD, a lot of people go straight into practicing medicine day to day. Um, so could you, to start us off, just talk a little bit about what made you decide to pursue the career that you have? You went right into industry, you decided to start your own company. So what was that thought process like for you? Yeah, when, when I, back, back when I was at Case and I started in 1985, uh, I was in the MSTP program. And one of the features of that program, which still exists today, is the way that they integrate the MSTP's medical scientist training program, the way they integrate the clinical portion and the scientific portion for those of us goofy enough to decide to pursue an MD and a PhD simultaneously. And when I got to, and, and so that took me seven years. And I loved the way that there was this dynamic interplay between the, 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 the clinical practicality and then asking scientific questions about process and what's underlying pathology and why do we do things a certain way. And when I got to my residency, um, I saw frankly where I thought medicine was heading, which was going to be, again, now this is uh, 1993, 92, moving, moving away from an environment where there was an opportunity for clinical and scientific innovative and entrepreneurial thinking and more to a situation where a patient comes in and presents and they have symptoms X, Y, Z, and therefore you are then, uh, then mandated to perform tests one, two, and three. And if the results give you know, D, E, and F, then your treatment is six, seven, eight. And it be, was looking like it was going to become much more formulaic and that it would be much more regulated and that the ability to straddle all of that and be doing it in an environment of entrepreneurial and innovation uh, mindset, I thought was not gonna be the future. And for me, that's really what I wanted. I am absolutely thrilled and delighted that we have people who want to take care of patients every day and other people who want to be in the laboratory every day, and other people who want to organize and maintain, you know, um, the ability and the infrastructure to do that through lots of administrative efforts. Uh, so I left my residency at the University of Pennsylvania, and I um, joined a startup as the first scientist after the CEO. Now it turns out that that startup emerged from the laboratory where I did my PhD and I also did a fellow uh, one year fellowship on campus at Case. So I knew the technology very well, but it was for sure a very risky move because people don't typically leave the University of Pennsylvania, you know, oculoplastic facial reconstructive residency to go be a startup and half of my resident class hated me because I impacted their call schedule <laughs> because they had to take a little more call, not for long because they could replace me quickly. And the other half thought I was um, courageous and brave. And I'm happy to say, so that was my thinking. I'm happy to say that 30 years hence, now almost 30 years hence, it seems to have worked out. You know, I spent 25 years in 
working for companies, you know, from a small startup to a mid-sized company that publicly held, and then to almost a decade at Johnson and Johnson, and then five years at Becton Dickinson, and a few years at Stryker, um, and it, you know, seems to have worked out. So that's my thinking. If there's a question about, hey, what's the future going to look like? And I really, you know, when I teach in a classroom, I'm looking at people and. I'm also calling on people. I don't have the benefit of doing that here, but I'm happy to. I'm happy to have somebody explain their, you know, hey, I'm I'm troubled with this decision fork in the road. Hey, you know, where do you see this going or that going? Because I don't think you guys just want to hear me drone on for 55 minutes. Yeah, that's a great point. Does anyone in um, this panel want to unmute and talk about kind of where you're at in your career, um, introduce yourself, and any questions you have for Dr. Bruder? You can cold call, Shruti. This is the power, <laughs> power of being the moderator. Who um, wants to get, wants to about, I am so sorry, um, Brad, your video is on. <laughs> Why don't you introduce yourself? <laughs> I want to hear from Brad, but I think it's more telling when you call on people who, whose video is off, because if they're supposed to be getting any credit for this class and watching <laughs> television, you know, you call them right out. So Brad, go ahead, please. Happy to. I, I was brewing up a question anyway. Um, <laughs> so my name is Brad Goldstrom. I'm a master's student at Case, also recently graduated from undergrad, biomedical engineering. Um, I'm very interested in healthcare entrepreneurship, but I'm trying to determine whether I want to go immediately into, into industry and like the corporate world and try and gain some of that um, technical experience. Like I want to enhance my technical skills and also work on sort of like the business entrepreneurial mindset. So I'm trying to determine whether I want to go to a smaller company or that like larger industry side. So that's a common, you're in a common crossroads, right? Um, and part of what I would say there is a little bit, I'm going to ask you to stay, to come off mute again. I'm going to have a little interaction because this should be instructive and informative for everybody, not just you. But when you think about your own career trajectory, do you think about being more involved in the technical side and thinking about navigating a technical ladder or more about uh, an administrative and leadership side? So initially I would like to be on the technical side, but I like later in my career, I see myself being on more of the, the leadership administrative side. So people can make that transition. There's, you know, there's sort of two parallel paths. There's a technical path that can, ironically, it's, it's a funny terminology, but for example, at Johnson & Johnson, the very most senior technical person is called a fellow. So, you know, it's not like after you get your PhD and you go spend a year or two in somebody's lab, you're a fellow. You're, you're sort of very junior. At j and that's a fellow. Once you get to that level, it's hard to make a transition over to leadership and administration. It's very common for people to spend a couple, three years, maybe even four, but not more than that, on the technical side before making a transition to management, manage I, I, leadership is not, sorry. That's a wrong word. I should talk about management because you can be a very, very senior technical leader. I'll also say, and again, I have to make some generalizations, but um, if you want to be a technical leader at the very top of your game, it's unusual that people who have master's degrees achieve that level of seniority not because they're not smart or capable, but there are so many other people who have advanced degrees, who have PhDs, who sort of enter the workforce in the company with a running start, and they have more technical training. Now, having said that, I've seen many people come in with a master's, either an MBA or a master's in science, and come in and work in business development. And business development in terms of thinking about entrepreneurship and strategy, you have an opportunity, for example, to, um, to engage in due diligence. So business development is essentially the function inside these business units that's responsible for licensing, mergers, acquisitions, uh, and growing the business that way. And so often you get sent out on doing an analysis of a company, you'd certainly do an in-house analysis first before 
meeting with them, but then doing diligence. And that's, uh, you know, that's a, that's a career path. I feel at the moment, like I may have skived off your question a little bit. Can you bring me back to, to the question? Um, it was kind of just like where to start in a career, it, like given the, the goals and aspirations, but I think that is like still good. Like you, you provide some insight regardless. Yeah. I'm, uh, so there's two kinds of jobs I think I would encourage you to be looking at to apply for and talk about where to start your career. You know, look at your, your, with a master's, they would, they may call you, depending on the size of the company, they may call you a uh, research scientist one or engineer level one, or you could m join on the side of uh, um, analyst. That would be the kind of job title you might be looking for on the business development side. Then there's the whole question of, okay, do I join a small company or do I join a large company? The thing about joining a large company is there's usually a installed base of infrastructure that exists. And you know, that may include internal training programs and, and learning things about HR policies and, and lots of, you know, lots of sort of structured learning and some structured process, which can be useful. The other side of that is you, you could wind up being sort of a flea on a battleship. If you join a small company, and especially if it's a startup, you've got some risk. They have some risk and you have to be tolerant of having that risk. You want to understand something about their capital structure, how much money they have, what their runway is. If, if they have enough money to survive, they need to have more, more than enough money to survive for six months, right? And, and But when you go to a small company, like I and a lot of my colleagues did, you get to learn a lot of different things, right? So you, may, you're, you're, you come in as a technical laboratory person and you, then you get to learn about intellectual property and writing patents and reading patents. And then you get to think about, okay, well, you may have more direct engagement with people in regulatory affairs so that you have some perspective on how the things that you're designing or working on, how they have to be navigated through to meet the FDA standards, or even what we call process development. Because it's one thing to make 10 or 20 implants or devices that are gonna be used in a lab, you know, in some rats or bunnies or dogs. It's another thing to develop a process to manufacture this device or implant that's going to go in tens of thousands of patients. So it's a whole different science amongst itself. I have a, I have a follow-up question, but Shruti, um, do you want to, like, okay. Um, how do you think that you weighed like your desire to go into a smaller company versus the, the tolerance for risk at, the, at that point in your career? Yeah, well, it's a good question. It's going to be different for everybody. At that point, I was... Um, I'd been married less than a year. We didn't have children. And in my diligence, I knew that the company at the time, it was called Osiris Therapeutics. Some of you may have heard of it. Uh, Osiris had enough money for at least two years. And I figured that, and I also entertained an opportunity at Merck, which, so there are two extremes, right? I was going to be the first sign, I was going to be the second employee behind the CEO, or I'd go to Merck. And my feeling was that I had sufficient training and education as a sort of a pedigree in case gives you a wonderful pedigree and that I would learn enough in those at the bare minimum two years in that startup that if they folded, I had enough self-confidence that I'm gonna land somewhere else with my training underneath me and the experiences that I gained over those two years to be useful. I, you know, it's not like, it's not like I had two children already and I had a sick parent and I needed to, you know, be in a certain location. We were able to move wherever we needed. So again, it's sort of a very personal decision and what your, how your own risk tolerance is, right? I have a sufficient, sufficiently robust risk tolerance. I know other people who just don't. They just don't have it. And that's not a value judgment. They just want to go to Merck. 
you know, they want to go to J and J, they want to go to Lily, whatever. Yeah. Are there any other panelists here who are kind of in a different type of career path or maybe doing a different type of career that would like to pick Dr. Bruder's brain about anything or even the same kind of career path? And don't, I, I, I believe Shruti has a number of topics teed up. So this isn't the be yeah. all and end all topic we're talking about today. Absolutely. So I guess a good- um... uh, Yeah, oh. go ahead. I, I just want to ask one thing, um, Scott. So like, could you also, um, so I understand that um, you uh, started with the startup and like how many years did you work in the startup and then you transitioned to J and J and then Striker? So like in like very quickly, if you can uh, tell yes, it's like what you were doing, like five, the- five years in the startup from mm-hmm. two employees to about 125 employees, mm-hmm. five years there, two years in a mid-stage company called Annika Therapeutics, which is a mid-stage market cap public publicly held company, two years there, eight years at J&J, five years at, and, and so when I left Annika, I was hired into J&J as a vice president. I grew more and more responsibility at J&J and left there and joined Becton Dickinson as their chief science and technology officer in the C-suite and then lost my job. So, you know, these things, these things happen. Right, I lost my job because the and 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 actually this is a, a good lesson. Uh, I used to think, and a lot of people think, okay, well, once you make the C-suite, like you've you've hit the pot of gold, right? There, there's nowhere left to go, and you've made your you've made your mark. But uh, you serve at the whim of the CEO, and I had a wonderful five-year run with uh, Ed Ludwig, who was the CEO of Becton Dickinson, and then a new CEO came in. And he cleaned out the C-suite. Mm-hmm. He has no. He doesn't have to fire you for cause. You don't have to, you know, poison your peers. They can fire you, and they take care of you. But he fired almost the whole C-suite. Bring their then, own team. Sorry. He to bring, bring his own team. Yeah. Right. And um, and then I landed at Stryker. And without going through the details, a similar situation happened at Stryker, and whereas I thought. I, you know, I was sort of locked in. I had a great thing. I realized that now, so two years at Stryker and, and now I've been doing this six years. I have far more control over my own destiny now than I ever did before. However, I couldn't be doing what I do now had I not spent 25 years previously learning all the stuff that I learned. And now, you know, we're carrying, uh, I'm carrying 22 clients around the world. So if one of them decides, you know what, we've met all our goals, we're done, we're going to, you know, we don't need you now, I still have 21 other clients and I'll backfill with somebody else. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's much more in my control. And and plus, I get to go hike in the woods like this when I want. (laughs) Yeah. So it was a silver lining, right? They fired you. There's another pearl in there. (laughs) which is that sometimes finding yourself in situations that you don't intend to, to land in and you're, you're, you have responsibilities foisted upon you, whether you're a graduate student, whether you're an undergraduate student, whether you're an assistant professor, associate professor, or even a chairman, because the dean is, is gonna be foisting responsibilities on you or who, you know, who or the provost or the president or whoever is given, you know, professionals like Professor Kirsch, his marching orders. Sometimes you get marching orders that you're like, how did I get that? And um, those are the things that when you get across the other side of that, and this is meant for the first year undergraduate and for my chairman, Professor Kirsch, is when you get to the other side of that, you realize, wow, okay, I. I now have a new skill set and I've learned something that I wouldn't have voluntarily taken on myself, but it adds to my skill set and adds to my perspective. And one day, you know, 
should 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 Bob ever want to be a university president? You know, he's learned a bunch of stuff along the way. Mm. So on the topic of learning new skills, and we also talked a little bit about going into consulting as a good first step to people who are interested in entrepreneurship. Could you just let everyone here know a little bit about what your company does as a consulting firm and what that relationship is between like consulting firms and medical technology companies in the industry? Yeah, also, that's a good question. I don't recommend that people who are just getting out of school go join a boutique or small consulting firm. There are opportunities for them to join very large firms like McKinsey, Deloitte, PwC, um, LEK, you know, big, big firms that have training programs. That kind of consulting is sort of like being an analyst. Um, they typically, and that's, I'm going to, let me describe that and I'll describe a little bit about what we do. They typically engage, their fees are very high. So they going those kinds of firms. So they want to engage blue chip companies, J and J, BD, Stryker, Medtronic, uh, what used to be Bard, Covidian, you know, large companies. And those companies are facing challenges. They could face a challenge that relates to HR management. Could re it, it? They are not typically domain content challenges. They don't engage large consulting firms to help them figure out how to solve this clinical problem of, you know, uh, they're not gonna engage consulting firm to help them figure out how to figure out the, you know, brain device interface. They're not gonna figure that. They're not gonna engage you to do that. They're gonna engage them to figure out, okay, who are the constituents? So let's say we have a, 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 a concept for how we're gonna do the, brain device interface, they would engage them for addressing how do we manage all the other constituents, meaning the healthcare reimbursement process, the clinical trial CRO domain. How do they deal with insurance? How do they deal with things like integration with manufacturing? They tend not to be scientific domain specific issues at those consulting firms. They don't do that. They work on, they're called management consulting for a reason. They also don't typically do tactical work. They provide guidance and recommendations, but they don't do what I call actual work. Now, I'll contrast this with small boutique firms like mine. I have 12 people now. I have a mix of people that are regulatory, FDA regulatory affairs specialists and technical and business development and strategy. We would engage with a firm who has some product concept, but they don't really know how to get it developed. And so we help them navigate the process of product development. And we help them navigate, in many cases, the FDA regulatory strategy. But the FDA regulatory strategy boils down to essentially a set of FDA submissions and negotiations. And we actually write the submissions. We will write the submissions. We will engage the FDA. I'm on the phone at least once a week with someone from FDA, engaging them in, in, in the review and recommendations of that submission. And ultimately from requesting approval to start a human clinical trial in a, for a new device that's never been evaluated in humans, all the way to at the end when the trial date has been prepared and it's complete and you're trying to negotiate an approval label. So those are things that we do. We also, uh, we also help, we do diligence for companies. Large companies may call us and say, hey, you know, there's this company, some, some company that we're thinking about buying. Can you help due diligence because in, in my world, we are, we are domain experts. We are domain experts in what I'll call tissue repair, tissue protection, tissue healing, and tissue regeneration. And so that's using things like biomaterials, cell therapy, combination biomaterials and cells, combination growth factors, designer molecules and cells. Our, our, you know, we don't make new pedicle screws for the spine because 
the, or fracture plates that you would use if you fall. I mean, that's bread and butter, that's straightforward stuff. But we, you know, we're, we're domain experts in this, in this area. So with boutique firms, they're usually focused on one specific subject area? Often you, you have boutique firms that are just regulatory and they, you know, they may deal with devices, drugs, and biologics. There are other boutique firms that are design engineering. We have a client partner right now that's working with a, uh, a consulting firm and they do the design and engineering of surgical instruments. The company has an implant, but they don't know how to deliver it arthroscopically or with a robotic arm. So they have to engage a group that does that design engineering and can coordinate the manufacturing. There's mm -hmm. other clinical research organizations. They more like, they call them CROs. They may be more CRO than consulting boutique firms. There's also boutique firms that focus on uh, valuation technologies. So, or, or valuation processes that would help across different sectors and different industries to help companies get a third party assessment of what their valuation is how valuable they are so that they can use that information as they go out to potential investors and try to raise capital so that they can have enough money to execute on a development plan. I mean, those are just a few examples that come off the tip of my tongue. Yeah. So we haven't had any other questions come in just yet. I'm going to open it up to the floor. Does anyone want to raise their hand and introduce yourselves or ask a question? Somebody must have, somebody must have, you know, scheduled the time because they got something on their mind here. I have a question. So, uh, Scott, great to meet you. I'm the uh, Chief Commercialization Officer uh, at Veal here. Um, spent much time as a banker in the device space, so I uh, was excited to hear the story here. But I'd be curious, you've spent a lot of time with uh, your Chairman Bob and, uh, and others here in the BME department. There's a tremendous amount of innovation here, but it's always great to hear from outside folks uh, kind of where, where a case sits, um, you know, across the country in terms of innovation. I'd love to get your perspective uh, for those on the call here, and given you've had a, a, a really tight tie to the the program here. So that I mean, that's a that's a good question. It's also honestly, it's sort of a hard question for me to answer, and I'll tell you why. Well, one, I've got a bias. Okay, I've got a natural bias. You see, you see my jersey, right? <laughs> and I wore I wear that I wear this a lot, not just for today. Um, I'll say this, when I'm not, have, not inside a company like J&J or BD that may be always out actively looking for what the level of innovation is and who's doing what, I, I'm not doing that now. I haven't done that in about six, I haven't done that for six years. So I would say I don't have my finger clearly on the pulse of that. What I can say, and, and as a, individual who has been historically involved with a number of things in, in BME, you know, I'm, we, we're not, I'll say we, maybe it's me. I, I'm not currently engaged in sort of an outside reviewer's perspective that is going on in BME actively right now. And some of that's probably just a result of, of COVID and, and also before that, the challenge of okay, how how's case how are case and the clinic going to solve that, and how's that integration going to look, and what's going to be in and what's going to be out? So I don't have a working facile knowledge of that. But what I can say is, because I sit on an advisory board that's you know we meet like every two months in the medical school, and they've got this they've got these innovation programs, and they have dedicated people, which BME did not have when I first started getting involved 11 years ago. And then they installed a person to help with reach out. And that reach out is actually really important because it's not just like, hey, we do great science and everyone's going to come flocking here. Because there needs to be a, it's like innovation. You, I can't just, I'm going to pick on somebody. I just can't well, I'll pick on you, Todd. Let's just say you worked in my team. I can't just go call up Todd and say, hey, Todd, I need a great idea by Friday. Invent something. It doesn't work like that. I'm and on so, it. I'm on it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Challenge accepted. There's, 
So I, I've thought a lot about innovation and in industry and you have to actually, it sounds maybe a little counterintuitive, you have to create a process around how you become innovative. And it involves putting the right people in groups and, and putting them in, in, in an appropriate setting that has certain constraints and certain elements that are unconstrained and how you get them and, and inspire them to work together to come up with innovations. And then I, I was saying this piece about how do, you, how do you advocate for that from the university? How do you promote that? How do you bring awareness to that? I, I don't know, frankly, how active the technology transfer office is in outreach. You know, for example, if you've got people in, you know, I'll pick the, the you know, brain device interface. I don't, I don't know exactly what Professor Kirsch and his colleagues are, are doing. I mean, I read the magazines, right? And maybe I pick up the journals, but they, they should be at an appropriate time to be defined. They should be reaching out to medical device companies who they think could be supportive, uh, that would be interested in supporting and driving toward commercialization. But you have to understand what their interest is is in driving commercialization. Yes, Medtronic has been a fabulous partner to the university, but ultimately, you know, they got to sell product. And so if if there's another faculty member who has something related to, I, I don't know, some some novel uh drug delivery system, right? That could be suitable for example, if, if example, instead of giving medications parenterally or intravenously, if you could find a way to deliver that compound orally and it wasn't subject to the digestive enzymes of the GI tract, for example, if they could develop a system for that, then that technology transfer office and the principal investigator should do reach out, reach out to firms who perhaps have parenterally delivered therapeutics that would be, you know, if you can deliver something orally, it's way better than having to deliver it intravenously for a whole lot of reasons. And they should do active reach out and not necessarily expect that, hey, just because they had their paper published in Nature or, you know, whatever, that everyone's going to come calling. Maybe somebody will, but it, again, it's an active process. Sort of like that, the, the, I don't know if it's sort of like it, but there's, you know, there's, there's something, there's some process that, that is used to create the rankings of departments. And some of that uh, is, you know, national rankings of where, for example, where case is. Some of that is really very objective. And some of it, quite frankly, I, as I understand it from the peanut gallery here, involves uh, lobbying and having, you know, faculty and chairman sort of go out there and lobby on their own behalf. Or sometimes lobby on, so it looks like, Bob, you want to say something. I'll just say for department rankings, it's all a beauty contest, 100%. Yeah. There's no, there's no, nothing uh, quantitative involved at all. Um, you know, Jeff Dirk, when he was the chair, and then he became the dean, and I became the chair, and, and I said, Jeff, you know, how can we, what do we need to do to increase our rankings? He said, you have to convince your, your colleagues that you're doing well. That's it. You know, so it, it's kind of frustrating uh, the, the, that it's that way. But uh, on the other hand, that, that's it. One other thing while I have the, the floor we need to get you back to Cleveland when that's possible, uh, Scott. Uh, we have a Coulter program, which is, uh, is is flying, you know, miles high. It's doing fantastically, and it involves outreach, you know, immensely. But it also involves education of the faculty. You know, we've mentored the faculty to become much more entrepreneurially inclined. They still do their basic research, but they, they kind of have this, oh, I see, I could spin this out into a product now. And we've been quite successful at this. It's been, it's been very, 
very good. We have staff that uh, that guide this, and it's becoming kind of a self-sustaining pro. It has become a self-sustaining process now, almost. Well, um, you know, I've I've known about Coulter since Jeff. It's yeah, a, yeah, yeah. The early days, and you guys were one of the few that just had a re this high renewal rate. Yes, yeah. And that's fantastic. I'm happy to hear it. You know, especially while uh, while my daughter is still in Cleveland, it's a double draw for me. You know, it's it's about it's almost eight hours with traffic, whatever. It's, you know, I get in the car and come. I'd get in the car and come see her and, you know, spend a Friday or a Monday with you guys, if that makes sense. OK. So we have a follow up from Ben Noodleman. Ben, do you want to unmute yourself and ask? Is, is that is that it from the chair? Oh, I'll, I'll let others ask questions. <laughs> I, I, you know, but I, 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 I wave the flag when, whenever I'm out on the lecture circuit. My, you know, my title slide, sure, it has my logo, but it also has my affiliation with Case. So I proudly represent that. Well, we're proud to have you, Scott. Thanks, Bob. Sorry, there was a follow up. Yeah. Um, hi, Scott. Uh, my name is Ben. I'm a former uh, student uh, within the biomedical engineering department at Case. And then I actually did the master's in engineering and management program um, a few years back and, and found my way into industry in more of a, a business development and technical project management role, but in the, uh, in the hopes of getting back into, uh, into more operations um, focus within medical devices. I guess my follow-up question was to, uh, to Todd's um, specifically about some of the the infrastructure or the best practices that you've seen within either um, industry or, or, you know, the leading players like Johnson & Johnson or BD and Stryker um, when it comes to, to innovation or whether it's you've seen, um, you know, a geographic focus like, you know, areas like the the pharmaceutical focus in, in Cambridge and in Boston or, or things that, that Cleveland can do to, um, to build on that, that innovation mindset. So that's, it's a good and complicated question, right? I mean, what J&J &J did is they basically decided uh, not to invest hardly, or they decided to invest hardly anything in internal research and instead take the resource and, and create these incubators in Boston, in London, in Singapore, in Shanghai, in San Francisco, I've, there's a handful. And you're right, they do have some focus where I think the Boston incubator may be around, around uh, pharmaceuticals. I mean, that's an approach that frankly, my friends at J&J &J say, it's like a big, it's a big science experiment and it has not yet paid off. Sometimes it takes a long time for these experiments to pay off. So I'm not yet sure how that, how that works. Now, they did that because of the cluster of talent that exists in those areas, principally because of the embedded nature of the, of the industrial infrastructure and the draw that they could have to hire people. So if J&J &J puts an incubator for pharmaceutical development in Boston and they're gonna hire a bunch of 100 people or 25 people, they're going to get people from other companies and maybe smaller, medium-sized companies, and they're going to get them to join. And that's great. Um, Cleveland's a little different. You know, I grew up in Cleveland, and at least till I was a teenager, and I have a lot of fond feelings about Cleveland. But Cleveland is not quite the biotech or med tech mecca for industry. I think ways to be effective, and, I, and again, I, I, only, I know only enough to be dangerous here, but the kinds of things that BME intends to do with the powerhouse of the Cleveland Clinic has an opportunity to put some of those things on the map and draw attention. You know, I can't speak to any of the specific programs and projects, I'm just not close enough, but that kind of partnership is possible. I mean, there've been a few companies that I think tried and 
missed, tried to be in Cleveland or, or were in Cleveland and then missed, you know, like Gleatech was one. Gleatech came out of the university. Uh, unfortunately, that had a bad, that had a, a bad ending. Uh, Osiris came out of Cleveland and the city tried to keep it there uh, with some incentives, but the incentives and to build to create some biotech, the incentives weren't strong enough and the company went to Baltimore who made more incentives for the company to stay. I think there's probably a handful of others. Uh, I'm not close enough to know, but you know, you need to get some core and I don't think it's big. I don't think it's pharmaceutical. I think, you know, with the strength of the engineering at case and the strength of the clinical slash engineering interface with the clinic, as well as, you know, UH, I think that device piece is probably pretty strong. I don't know. There's a, sorry, there's a lot, a lot of rambling there. No, that was great. Thank you. So we have time for one last question, I think, and it'll be from Mohammed. So, um, Scott, I have a follow-up question. So you were mentioning that, you know, some of the faculty, like they are like working on their uh, publishing papers and uh, doing some development. So they should engage like industry like Medtronic and see if they are interested in commercializing those, uh, those things. So, so what I understand with my limited knowledge is that like these big companies, like they, they like, because the, whatever come out from the lab, it is very, premature, right? And they want it to be like some sort of a spin off and then like become more mature. So like, what do you think? Like how is it possible that these products get mature in the lab environment or they should go to the spin off and then, then engage these com uh, big companies for commercialization? That's also a really good question. And part of that has to do with what you as a university investigator, what you think you can get in terms of grants and what you can get in terms of support. And there are other, you know, aside from NIH and NSF, there's DOD, there's Department of Defense grants. Those tend to be large grants. There's NIST grants. And, and some of those ATP grants, SBIR grants, those are, you know, intended to help take a technology into an early stage of business. Now, it's generally true, generally true, that companies aren't going to invest in a research project in a, in a laboratory before um, one, either you are solving a specific problem that they have, in which case it tends to be more like contract research I have a problem at my company, I have a technical problem, I need a solution, I'm gonna engage your lab to help me. That's different than you coming up with an idea for a product. If you're coming up with an idea for a product, for me as a company to be interested in it, I'm gonna to need to see not only that you filed the patent, but really that you have an issued patent. Because if you don't have an issued patent, it's not protectable. And, and given the way the patent rules are, have evolved, you know, it's still a pretty long time. You still have a pretty long time. So you can file your patent, get it issued, use that for your own way to generate seed funding for a company. Seed funding, you know, two, four, six, eight million dollars to get your proof of concept going. And it's highly unusual. It has happened, right? But it's typically unusual that a company like one of these companies you're talking about is going to come in, you know, to Professor Johnson's lab and pay him a ton of money for that invention and then engage them, Professor John, you know, the fictitious Professor Johnson, engage them in the whole development pathway. You know, at some point you have to make a decision. Are you a university professor or a university professor that is leaving to start a company? <laughs> and, and, you know, oftentimes the death, the death, the, you know, it becomes a drag 
on the company when the university founder inventor is involved in the company and trying to manage the company and also manage their laboratory and all kinds of conflicts arise. So, uh, you know, it's not typical that you'll invent something and have Medtronic swoop in and pay you a ton of money for it. Awesome. Thank you so much, um, Scott, for everything, um, for all of the nuggets of wisdom you gave us today and for everyone else for asking questions. Um, I'm going to throw it back to Michael to sign us off. Great. Trudy, thank you for moderating. I feel like we're training Scott a great with, with, with as, as during this, because it's only apropos with the presidential election on our mind, but we've watched moderators, you know, from Chris Wallace on down struggle. And here we are at your alma mater training the best and brightest moderators. So uh, thank you, Shruti, for doing a great job. And uh, Scott, thank you for joining us for conversation today. As you mentioned, we, we prefer and we look forward to getting you back on campus and, and we so appreciate you coming back. And it's awesome that your daughter's here. Um, but in, in the pandemic times, we do what we can. So this was a great format and, and thank you so much for engaging with the, with the folks that joined today. Thanks for inviting me. I'm, I'm happy to be here. Uh, I love talking to students and faculty and usually, you know, when I go and give a lecture or seminar or something, I, I always learn something. And that's what's fun because the, you know, you, you, you could get, it's easy for me to get a little isolated, even with the woods, but I mean, it's easy for me to get a little isolated in my own thinking and a little insular and having, and I always say when, you know, before I start my lecture, I'm probably going to say something that somebody here doesn't agree with, right? Or, or I could say something that's actually incorrect. So call me out, right? If you don't, and if you don't, where it's fact or not fact, if it's not correct. If you disagree with my view on something, bring an alternative view and let's just, let's talk through it because my mind is fluid and can be changed. And, you know, maybe your mind will be changed as well, but I'm happy to keep talking. And I'm, as you can tell, I'm happy to respond to invitations. So, you know, whether there's something that's an additional virtual event with you or with uh, 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 my chairman, uh, or an actual event live, you know, you guys know how to reach me. Awesome. I'll be in the woods. <laughs>